Hey guys, this is Savannah from earthandwater.co. Today I am here with a guest, David RL. He does a lot of things. You have a podcast called Baby Talk. Yes. Indeed. Yep. That's one of them. And then you have a book. Yeah, that's Welcome to Fatherhood is the book that uh, is the sort of umbrella organization that covers most of the other little things that I do. Yep. Which I love the marketing for because uh, it's WTF, Welcome to Fatherhood. That- yeah, that there's a strong overlap between the more common usage of WTF and how I use it in the book as Welcome to Fatherhood. That's that's not an accident. <laughs> oh, I'm sure it's not. And I mean, it's so uh, appropriate to parenthood just in general because that yeah, WTF dude, parenthood. Yeah. Just just today I had a little thing pop up on Facebook like a reminder picture from 4 years ago. This picture of my son who was 3 at the time. And he's in his car seat and he's looking at me like this and he's covered with chocolate. And he was like, look, dad, I'm a cheetah. Because <laughs> I just given him like a little tiny piece of chocolate from the front seat. And then he was quiet for a minute and I turned around. And I was like, what just happened? And he had just smeared it everywhere to cover his face like a cheetah or a tiger. So I even had a reminder just today of how much there is many WTF moment from we're pregnant till right this very minute. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes, there is. And I don't think that people who don't have children really understand. Uh, I call it the trenches of parenthood or the battlefront because that's literally what it is. Yep. Yep. And every additional child is like an X to the fifth power complexification of the scenario. We have several friends with one kid. And I remember when we've had our first kid, we we're like, wow, this is a lot. And then we had our second and we're like, uh, and then we have friends who have like four kids or five kids. And uh, it's, it, I just, I, I am amazed. Uh, people with one are amazed at how you do a two. People with two like us are amazed how you do a three and four. And it just, you just, it's a live fire exercise every day, right? Absolutely. Cause I also have two and uh, two is more than plenty for me. And uh, yeah, I have friends who have that many and, but they say that the, once you hit like, I think it's like four. Once you hit four, it just gets easier because you have the other ones to kind of help and pick up the slack. Right. Right. I was told that also. Um, but my my wife and I are both the eldest of three. And we joke that our youngest siblings are both a little bit wonky. So we should decide it, given our family genetics, we should just stop with two and not risk the wonky donkey third child situation here. And my brother and our, uh, my, you know, my sister-in-law, we love you guys. And we, we joke about this all the time. This is not a, uh, a slam on them, but we joke that we should probably just stop a two for everybody's sake. <laughs> I always wanted four. And then, uh, because, you know, you get that when with three, um, I always thought that uh, with two, there was a lot of competition and it turns out that was just mostly my family I was raised in. But uh, with three, you get that middle child syndrome, like you said, kind of. And then uh, with four, though, you kind of balance everything out. But no, I mean, two is plenty for me. And you know what? Uh, I have I've always had a policy to where I wasn't really allowed to have friends over too much when I was growing up. So I always said that if my kids want their friends to come over, then I was always going to say yes, if I could. And let me tell you what, some days I really regret that just because <laughs> it is. <laughs> some days you just can't, out. right? <laughs> uh, it's, it's, oof, man, I do anyway. I totally sacrifice my own mental health and to-do lists for the sake of what's actually important in life. And that is the children, right? Because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I had um, some friends when I was growing up whose parents absolutely always allowed me to come over if I needed to, if I wanted to. And that's what I wanted for my children as well, is that, you know, their children are going to want to do things. And if you create an environment and the space that's safe for them and their friends Mm -hmm. and fun. So, you know, they want to hang out at your house rather than go out and God knows what, um, right. Right. You know, that's the, that's my philosophy anyway. It's what's, Focusing on them and allowing them space is what's actually important in life, which is how, you know, I kind of got into the world of what we're going to be talking to or talking about, which is, um, you know, the family unit and how it's the core of society. And especially in our society in America, I assume you're 
in America, right? Or in a the yeah, US. I'm in I'm in Fairfax, Virginia, just right outside of DC. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm in Alabama, so you know the culture on in the West in the Western world has kind of always been pushing the children and the parents to the side, sort of like you know they've. This is just from what I've read and whatnot. Obviously, I wasn't around uh, 50 years ago or Mm -hmm. earlier, but um, the general parenting methodologies back in the day was just a shoo shoo go play. And we didn't really hug them or love them or listen to them. And, you know, we could we could say this points back to a lot of factors of why we ended up like that, you know um people just generally had 12 to 20 kids of until like you know my both uh, all four of my grandparents well I guess I have six all six of my grandparents were one of 10 to 18 you know mm-hmm And when you have that many kids, you can't give them all everything they need to thrive and hope and develop. And if you can't give them all what they need, then the default would be just to kind of give none of them what they need. Yeah, because you only have so much attention to to give and a minute spent here is a minute not available for there. Yep. And with, you know, 10, 15 kids or even you know, six, seven, whatever that is, it's just, there's only so many, so many minutes in the day and so many, so much energy you have, especially if you're trying to manage all of that to have any kind of one-on-one attention. It's like group story time or group bath time or group dinner time. So it is tricky to even have the possibility to cultivate the relationship with the kid that the child is going to appreciate as one-on-one, like I'm getting mom's attention, dad's attention in a positive way. So it's almost impossible from a, just a, just a time space management, you know? So I'm very sympathetic to the challenges that uh, the, the super large families from our, from our history uh, was faced with, you know? Absolutely. And, you know, that's exactly the struggle that I have nowadays. Well, I think two is more than plenty. And then, you know, I have, little adopted kids that come in every now and then my friends or my kids friends uh and giving each one of them everything they need is next to impossible and still having like the capacity to navigate and manage your own uh emotional needs and Mm -hmm. whatnot so tell us how you decided to get into all of this so the uh the short version is um my wife and I were intentional about we were going to start a family. I just sold uh, some cafes that I had owned in a previous chapter of my life. And the plan was that I was going to be the stay home parent because she was on a new career track as a pediatric nurse practitioner in the air force. And so we had moved to a different town. We were in Philly. We moved to Omaha. You know, we didn't know anybody and she was in a brand new job and I was going to be home. And the plan was when we eventually got pregnant, that was going to be the role. And it turns out we were pregnant right away. And so I wanted to be that, I wanted to be a good dad. I wanted to be devoted to my kid. And I really focused on that, but I didn't really find a lot of support in the larger culture for what I needed to learn and what was going to work for me as a dad who was trying to, you know, really show up. I kept getting these, you know, like, oh, just be helpful and supportive. And I'm like, yeah, that's why I'm standing here. Like you, you literally just told me nothing. What does that, what does that mean here today? What does that look like? And like, oh, just, you know, just, you just got to be, you got to be there. And I'm like, I'm standing right here. Like, you're not like, uh, you're not landing for me. Or it would be like, oh, on week 17 of gestation, baby's growing eyelashes. I'm like, okay, I guess that's kind of cool. But like, that's got, I am going to do nothing different today based on that information. So I got a lot of like the medical stuff, which is interesting, but not helpful. Or I got be helpful and supportive, which was neither helpful nor interesting. So I kept kind of having to guess of what does it look like here? And we took some birth classes. Uh, We took two different birth classes in our first pregnancy. And, you know, my wife and I were kind of like hippies. I I don't really look like a hippie, but that's sort of our like mindset. We wanted to, we would have had a natural birth in a barn given our choices, 
but because she's in the Air Force, like, oh, that's funny. We're going to be in the hospital. <laughs> nice try. So um, we had a very sympathetic OB who was very willing to go with a sort of low, no intervention birth plan and very supportive of that process. And then coming back home, my wife was fortunate enough to have three months off of uh, maternity leave, which is great. And I was home. So we kind of had like a lot of things going for us and we still struggled so much. Like I got no helpful advice from the culture or even some friends and family about how to be a, a supportive partner, like for real, rather than just this pithy idea of be helpful and supportive or, or how to be, what does it mean to be a good dad? What does it mean to be a good partner? So, and there's not a lot of easy examples to look at in the mm -hmm. culture. It's like, well, I don't want to be like some, you know, Homer Simpson, I don't want to be like Clint Eastwood in some old Western. Like, what does it mean to be a healthy masculine? What does it mean to be a great dad? Where are we seeing masculinity talked about in the culture in a positive way, rather than just the word toxic in front of it, everywhere you look like, where, what am I supposed to model my behavior after my poor dad, when I was born, and again, this is a few years ago, he was only allowed to hold me for a half hour a day per 24 hours under strict nurse supervision. And even this, I was in the NICU for a couple of days. My mom had to get, she had to get some extra emergency care. So they would like bring me in and like plug me on and let me nurse for a little bit. Then they would stuff me back in the incubator. And my mom was like half unconscious. And my dad's allowed to hold me for a half hour. It's like, what, what did, we're better now than we were then. But like he, he was not able to provide like, oh, when I, when you were born, I did all these things. So my book and all my work essentially is like, what did WTF is this? I don't know if I can curse on your show, Savannah. So I oh, won't yeah, you, unless yeah, you, uh, so I was like, what the fuck is this? Like, this isn't helpful. Like I'm trying to be a good dad. So I get a lot of guessing wrong, a lot of being frustrated. And it's, you know, it's kind of like showing up for a new job and like, here's all your stuff. And you start doing it. And they're like, no, that's not right. That's you did it wrong. Oh, that's not right. You know, you have to go sit and time out. I'm like, can somebody show me what to do? I'm like, no, you have to figure it out. That's the yeah. fun part. And I'm like, this is bullshit. <laughs> so anyway, I had a long list of notes and I started putting all that together. And eventually I had the welcome to fatherhood workshop. And now that's my book. And in the book, just real quick, there's like 13 big ideas. Like guys understand things this way, not this other way. And you will have an easier time. And then there's 29 dad tips, which are very specific. Like dude, Hire a doula. That's dad tip number seven. That's the one I'm like 100% on. No ifs, ands, or buts. Dad tip number six is take a birth class. All you dads out there listening. So these are like, do this. And then I have five scary moments, which are like, you know, scary moment number one is that first 12 weeks and the, and the miscarriage idea. So I'm like, look, you have to understand what's happening here. Do not say, that's okay. We'll try again next month. Like, don't do, this is a big deal and you should handle it with care compassion, awareness, and there's four other ones. So I'm not going to bog us down on the top, on the content, but that's, that's what came out of my experience and talking with other dads and moms and doulas and midwives, and just sort of collecting all this information and putting into 200 pages of like straight facts, funny anecdotes, and all the places I screwed up along the way. <laughs> I absolutely love that. I love everything about that. Um, I was a doula for a couple of years. Um, I, you know, I probably never actually would have went into it had it's gosh, it's so much. Um, you know, I got into this world when I became a parent myself and, mm -hmm. uh, well, even before I became a parent, because, uh, I would also put us on the hippie side of things and so, you know, I wanted to know what was going on and what was what. And uh, we actually miscarried our first at mm. 15 weeks, which mm. was an extra shock because, uh, you know, you think that once you hit that 12 weeks mark that you're in the clear and then, you know, you start right. relaxing a little bit. And yeah, so there was that. And then so just from my own experiences of that and then you know we had to go to the hospital and I was in the hospital for three days and ended up having to have surgery and the interacting with the staff was a complete and utter shock because mm. here I was experiencing what was up until that moment in my life the worst moment of my life and the attitudes of the staff was so like 
nonchalant. So uh, like a couple of them rolled their eyes at me and things. Um, mm, that's just, terrible. Just rude. Just absolutely rude. Um, we told them, well, I won't get into all that. But then moving on, we uh, got pregnant with my son. And that whole experience was just your basic default um, conveyor belt top. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the cultural conveyor belt, we, we call it. You just kind of get on and you do the things. And nine months later, you keep doing the things and a baby pops out and they're like, good luck. I'm like, what? Well, well, wait, <laughs> what do you mean? It just dumped me off at the end. Like, why doesn't this conveyor belt keep going? <laughs> Where's my help now? Yeah, no, it's terrible. Nobody, and you know, the sensitive nature of birth uh, makes, again, Western people kind of shy away. We get all like uptight because, you know, we were founded by Puritans. And that means that we're all like just kind of uptight. <laughs> we don't want to talk about bodily functions or um, emotions and the wide variety of emotions that comes with becoming a parent because mm -hmm. it is the most transformational period of anyone's life. And then um, I had my daughter, which I had to promise everybody I would not birth in the garden. Um, because <laughs> I was terrified of the system. Most likely if not, maybe, but I'll try not to, right? <laughs> That's exactly how it was. I made no promises. <laughs> I stayed with the doctor I hated. I fought her every mm. step of the way. Well, sorry. No, she fought me every step. There we go. Oh, and that's tough. Yeah. To, you know, uh, the fear tactics, the, you know, she straight told me that if I had a French fry during uh, labor, I would aspirate and die. Um, I, I, right. Like, come on, come on. Um, she told me, she said, she, uh, the, sugar test that they do where you have to drink the stuff and all oh, right uh right well i've had uh sugar issues my whole life so <clears throat> i've had to be very careful my whole life with how much sugar i intake because mm -hmm. it causes problems with me anyway i used to pass out all the time because of sugar issues so if you give somebody who already has sugar issues a ton of sugar and then wait to see if anything bad happens. Well, chances are something bad's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. <laughs> what a concept, right? So, and then she told me, uh, I was going over my birth plan with her and she told me, she was like, well, it sounds like you just want me to stand in the corner and twiddle my fingers. I was like, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. exactly <laughs> what I want you to do. <laughs> Good. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but yeah, no, I, I ended up uh, staying with her through the whole pregnancy, even though we did not job at all just because she was the closest doctor at closest hospital so mm. that I could stay at home for as long as I could and right. my everything worked out perfectly my daughter was born 45 minutes after I arrived at the hospital everything went wonderful perfect and then but you know it's not over at that point at that point I still had to fight my doctor she didn't like me because you know I was informed and uh told me and you were right <laughs> I was, and that was man it was so frustrating and not only did I have to fight the medical system but I had to fight friends and family who also thought that you know you know we put doctors up on this pedestal and we forget that they're human just like you and me and if you get a doctor who doesn't necessarily have your best interests at the top of their priority list then, you know, you end up in a cascade of interventions. And so, yeah, anyway, I became a doula because I saw how mismatched the system was to what it should be. Because, you know, we get put on the conveyor belt and then, but yeah, I don't do doula work anymore. I might get into it later in life, but I still remain very passionate about the subject. Right, right. That's good. I'm glad. You know, I'm sad you had to go through those experiences, but I'm glad that you took them and you transmuted them into compassion and awareness and bringing, you know, birth work into your larger things that you do. So that's, I'm, I'm glad you were able to, to make a win out of it. And, and again, it's kind of like my experiences go through a lot of frustration to but be able to come out the other side with like, let me make, let me try to make things easier for the people coming up behind me. So definitely see a lot of overlap there too. 
Yes, that's the goal, right? Um, noticing what we are having to navigate in our culture and society, and then turning that into uh, what can we do now to help the people coming up behind us? Yeah, mm-hmm. that's absolutely the point. So what are your best tips? So Obviously. let's see, I think, <laughs> that, well, there's a lot. So what one of the main backbone of the book, and this would be speaking to the guys out there, yeah. is what I call the dude zone to dad zone journey. And do you want like the three minute, the five minute? Cause I, I could spend a while on this and I don't want to, I don't want to take up too much time here. No, this is your episode. I'm here to all right. you take up all of it if you want. All right. So this is the main deal guys, everybody out there pay attention. So the dude zone, as I describe it is if you take your partner and your job and you kind of put those off to the side for a minute, what are all the other things that make you, you, I have it in three categories. What are your social things? Like who are your buddies and what do you do to connect with them? What are your kind of core activities? Like what have you been doing forever? And it's just like, if you're, if you got fired and your partner left you, you would still be doing these same things because this is part of who you are. And then what's your self-care? Like how do you recharge your batteries? Do you like to read quietly in a corner? Do you like to go dancing? Like what is the thing that you do that you really feel connected to yourself? And when you get when you, when you like stop doing that, you're like, all right, like I feel grounded in who I am. So I say, what are these things and write a list on them? Cause as you go into the dad zone, what's going to happen is your family responsibilities are going to continue to increase every day of that pregnancy. You're going to be doing more things with and for your partner. You'll be more, doing more things to get ready for baby. You'll be doing more things to maybe change some things in your life around, like really try to get that promotion now to kind of improve your financial situation, but you're going to be pushing more time, effort, energy, and money into family side, which is necessarily going to come at the expense of those dude zone activities. So where so many guys get caught up is they keep thinking, this is just, I'm going to bounce back. I'm going to, I'm going to do this for now. Then I'm going to go back to all the things I'm going to go fishing all the time. Again, I'm going to go golfing all the time. Again, I'm going to do all these things. So every time like Oh, honey, do you want to go to the baby store and fill out the registry? They're like, ah, okay. But in their head, but next Saturday, I'm going fishing. And then next Saturday comes around like, oh, honey, let's go to the the hardware store and look at paint colors. I want to think about painting the nursery. And they're like, ah. And so they keep thinking like, they keep like imagining that they're getting, they're building up credit that they can go cash in for all this stuff. And it's like, nah, man, there's no bouncing back. You're only bouncing forward. So if you understand that this is the journey you're on. You understand that this is the cost that you're not only will you pay, but you should be paying gladly. Then you can look at those dudes on things like, okay, I want to stay connected to these things at least a little bit. So how do I understand that I'll be less? Maybe I won't go fishing four mornings a week. It'll be one morning a week and it won't be for four hours or for two hours. So you got to find a way to stay connected because you can't just give up all of yourself. Yeah. But that balance is tricky. And and the two mistakes that guys make, I call the dud zones. And this is the dud zones of Wimpy Town and Jerkville. And Wimpy Town are those guys that are like, yes, dear, sure. Okay, fuck it. I guess I'm just fucking married man, dad, person. No more dude zone. Goodbye. No more fun for me. Man, they're kind of weak and depressed and sad. And they're just sort of like standing there like, you know, yes, dear, whatever you want, dear. And like, nobody wants that. Like the guy's not happy. Their partner's not happy. Their partner's like, what happened to you? Mm -hmm. Like this is, I don't want a servant. I want a partner, a teammate. Mm -hmm. So that's wimpy town. And the guys who go the other way are like, I'm not pregnant. You're pregnant. Okay. You don't drink, please. You're, you have our baby, but I'm going out to the bar and it's nine o'clock and I'm going out. Don't wait up. And it's like, they have this sort of like, I'm doing me. They're all about the dude zone. And they're kind of like, angry and resisting the dad's own family responsibility sign. So these are traps. This is not a good place. And not only will every guy be in both of those from time to time, but you often find yourself with one foot in one and one foot in the other. Like, I don't care. Just tell me like yesterday you want ice cream. I bring you ice cream today. And now you want pickles and today I bring it tomorrow. I bring you pickles. You're going to want ice cream again. So fuck me. I guess I just guessed wrong. And now you're mad at me. Just tell me what you want and I'll do it. So they're kind of like defeated and mad at the same time. Mm. And so I'm like, this, that's okay. You're go- you're going to find yourself there, but you have to see the dad zone, understand it's striking a healthy balance and then thriving in the dad zone is sort of owning this journey 
owning the responsibility that comes to the family side, owning the responsibility to yourself to make time. Like, hey, babe, this weekend coming up, I'm going golfing on Sunday. So let's do baby stuff on Saturday so we can take care of our family. And that way you're like protecting your time. You're you're speaking to mama because mama's a mom now. As soon as she see the pregnancy test, she's like, oh, I'm a mom. <laughs> and us guys are like, oh, we'll be a dad much later. So all that is kind of like the main backbone of the of my work. And a lot of things sort of are kind of hang on that as like an offshoot of that at different points of that trajectory. So dude zone to dad zone, watch out for the dud zones of Wimpy Town and Jerkville and dad zone thriving, which is the goal as you're doing well in that balance and speaking to and giving time to all of the family responsibilities and your personal sense of self, your sacred individuality, I call it. And you found a way to do that well on both sides. So that's dad zone thriving. I love every bit about that. <laughs> every bit of that, the communication, the uh, realness of it. I mean, obviously I'm not a dad, but I am blessed and lucky enough to have a partner who I recognized all of those pieces in. He's wonderful, but it took him a minute to get there, right? Because um, like you said earlier, there's not a lot of role models or examples for what healthy, sacred masculinity should be and can be. Mm -hmm. And so it's a learning curve, just like it is with anything else. And our society and cu culture for so long has put dads on like the back burner of the, well, I mean, they're not really on the back burner of the family unit. They're the outside the home providers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So everything inside the home, including child rearing from start to finish is placed on the mother generally. And um, right. we are wonderfully, awesomely moving out of that. And you see more and more involved dads and that is wonderful, but we still, it takes a little bit of time to get our mindset out of that. You know, for example, um, to this day, you hear moms complaining all the time that uh, dads can change one diaper and they get all the praise and yeah so i know i'm glad that you're doing this because um as someone who comes from birth work to an extent it is very mother central and yeah. men need men, men need something too they do and i've always what? done this to include the fathers very because i'm not going to be there forever like i'm going to be there for a very short amount of time right I need him to realize and know how to support. Yeah. Like you were saying earlier, be there and be supportive. Okay, great. Uh, twiddle thumbs and wait to be told what to do. <laughs> right. Right. Well, you know, Savannah, this is exactly the crux of the issue. Like, you know, we've talked about how our culture is shifting, but one of the things where I start my book is what I call the dad instinct. And I, I really, I really like to spend time on this with the guys in my group. So before I did my book, I was doing live workshops before COVID and everything happened. So I would have six guys and they're all kind of nervous. They're like, oh, my wife told me to go to this class. So what are we doing here? And I'm like, hey guys, how's it going? All right. So when you're thinking about having a baby, what are you most excited about? What are you really looking forward to? And I would be chuckling to myself because I know these answers. Oh, I can't wait to teach my kid how to ride a bike. I can't wait to take them fishing. I can't wait to teach my little girl softball. I know we're having a girl and, you know, my sister was a softball player and it's in our family. And I'm like, no, okay, okay. <laughs> and I'm like, how old are your babies and all these pictures in your head? And they're all like, oh, like three. I'm like, yeah, you got a thousand days and nights between you're a dad and when any of that shit's happening. Yep. And it's like, isn't it funny how we're all, all, all of you, none of you said, I can't wait to hold my baby at two in the morning when they're screaming at three weeks old and my partner's sitting here crying and her boobs are leaking and we're both having another terrible night. I can't wait for that. Like nobody ever says that, you know, cause it's just not, it just doesn't enter our minds. And that's because, you know, looking way back in the way back machine, again, this is a rough generalization. I'm sure there's people out there are going to find one little thing that's different and be like, but you're wrong, but that's not how generalizations work. Yeah. Um, us guys were not only, not expected to be part of the prenatal team or part of early baby child rearing, we were actively like, no, like a caveman standing next to a brand new baby is going to get like, get out of here. What are you doing? Go do, go be useful, go away out, do something else. Um, and even up until like a hundred years ago, there were no male obstetricians. It was all midwives, like birth and child rearing 
was women focused, women centric. And us guys were not only not invited, we were disinvited. Mm -hmm. And now, thankfully, things are changing, but it's not fair to look at men and be like, why are you guys doing it wrong? Like, well, we have a hundred thousand years of being told to wait in the corner till the baby's three, number one. And number two, you guys are all, all of the birth space. I'm like one of the few guys in the birth space. And I had a, I had an old midwife tell me older than that. She was 75 when I was first starting this work. She was like, David, this is, this is a fourth career for me, but I was entering the corporate world in the eighties. And as a woman entering corporate executive life in the eighties, I worked for a big fortune 100 company. What I was told was essentially, if you want to be successful here, be like a man. And she's like, and this is what I hear in the birth space for all these dads. They're surrounded by other women. They're saying, well, if you want to be successful, you need to do X, Y, and Z, which is like, be more like a woman, just be helpful and supportive. Well, okay. But what does that mean? And she's like, so it's really nice to see more men coming in here, talking to men by men with language that were, you guys are familiar with concepts that work for you and helpful, direct, specific guidelines that work for you guys. It's a very different space. And so we all need to have a little bit of space and grace, some acclimatization, appreciation, some time, some understanding, some sympathy, what helps you, what works for you, and, and just kind of open up that conversation to a much broader perspective and really focus on like, hey, we're all trying our best here rather than you're doing it wrong. You know, not that again, I'm, these are all generalizations, but I think that really lands for a lot of the guys that I continue to work with today. When I talk about the dad instinct and they're like, Oh God, thank you. Thank you. Cause I thought I was broken. I thought I was doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. And real quick, final point on this, and then I'll shut up. Mm -hmm. I'm doing, um, I have a podcast episode coming out. We're talking mm -hmm. about biological differences in new moms and new dads. And I just discovered that I, we all know that new moms when that oxytocin is flowing that helps the breast milk come down, come down. It, it helps the milk. Um, what's the word? Uh, not drop or release, but like um, come in when it helps the milk come in. And when they're nursing baby, that oxytocin is that love hormone, that connection, that bonding. And I would see this with my wife all the time. Like she's nursing our, our son and our firstborn and she's sitting there and she's all blissed out and he's all blissed out. And I'm like, Oh good. That's cool. But it turns out that us guys, we have the same oxytocin loops, but they're activated by play. So when we're playing with baby, we're like, oh, this feels great. This feel, I feel, I'm feeling the chemicals of love coming out through this interactive play where a lot of guys in my group, they're like, David, I, I can't just sit there and hold the baby. It's like boring, frankly, like what's going to happen now? And my, <laughs> but my wife's always like, why don't you ever hold the baby? I, I mean, I love holding it, but do you, don't you like our baby? He's like, so I feel guilty. I mean, I do, but like not for more than like a few minutes, you know? Um, and I say, look, hold him anyway, you know? Um, but then I'm like, just to help you understand, like, this is why your partner's like, why is he playing with the baby so much? Why is he throwing the baby in there? Why is he always like wrestling with the baby? It just, this is how we're built differently. And so that awareness can help create the space and appreciation how dad tip number 27, fathers don't mother. This is one of those spaces like, oh, he's going to have his relationship with baby. That's going to look different than mine. It's going to feel different than mine. And that's good. And I want to encourage that just like the, I tell the guys, encourage your partner to breastfeed, encourage your partner to hold baby. I tell them to get the baby wearing devices. I'm like, wear your baby as often as you can. That way you can still do stuff and make a sandwich and cut the grass and go do all the things you want to do. And you're right there with your baby. You're bonding with your baby. You're connecting with your baby. So you don't just have to sit on the couch. And after 10 minutes, be like, can I can I do anything else? Cause this is boring, you know? <laughs> so the oxytocin loop, I think is, is the final point I want to make on that. There, there are, this isn't just me making up shit over here. There's actual science and biology behind a lot of the things we've seen and recognized in the culture. I love that you pointed that out because I didn't know that, you know, I knew, I knew what caused us women to release oxytocin and bond and whatnot, but yeah, you don't talk, people don't talk about it with the dads. So, mm -hmm. but since you mentioned it though, my kids figured out from a very early age that mom, grandmother, aunt, we were for cuddling and food and love and dad, uncle, grandfather was fun. So, you know, if you want to play, then that's who you need to go right. talk to. But if you want to sit right. and, and cuddle, then we're who you hang out with. Right, right. And, you know, I, I honestly, I loved holding my kids like as the as the person who's home with them all the time. You know, I was always told my baby, we, we did a lot of things like co-sleeping or shift sleeping where 
one of us was always within arm's reach of baby. And I loved when he would like kind of snort and I would just put my hand on his chest or with my daughter, she would wake up and kind of have a little fit. I'd be like, oh, I'm here, you know, so I, I love that. And I love playing a lot more. Like even my dog, who's a three-year-old chocolate lab, just last week discovered he knew how to fetch and liked it. And now I like my dog better because we can play together rather than yeah. him just sort of laying on top of me. I'm like, oh, this is funny. Like I had learned that a couple of weeks ago. I'm like, oh, I can see it happening right now. We're playing. So I'm feeling more connected to my dog in the same way as with my babies when, you know, I'm like holding the little fingers and making them move around. So anything that feels like play, I always encourage my new dads, like do something that feels like play. Even if you're just pulling on, you know, they're holding your thumb and you just make a little game out of it. That's going to help trigger that 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 chemical response that's going to help you bond better with your baby and vice versa. That's awesome. That's a very valuable tidbit of information. Thank you for sharing for that. Sure, I sure. I, I was a birth doula, so I didn't participate a whole lot in the after, you know, mm -hmm. baby was here. <clears throat> I usually came and hung out and did postpartum doula work is caring for the mother, caring for the household, caring for the baby so that the mother can care for herself, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, there wasn't yeah. a whole lot of teaching the uh, dad at all. Dad, most of the time, wasn't even there when I right, right. postpartum work. I did try to include dad in the, po in the prenatal care and stuff, but a lot of times they didn't even come to the meetings either. Well, it's so hard because us guys are like, baby, I mean, Maybe it's not going to be here for three months. Like, what am I? I'm not pregnant. Like, I'm, I can sit there. But like, again, like, that just doesn't feel like I'm doing anything. And if you're working, it's like, hey, boss, can I take three hours off to go sit by my wife's side and hold her hand, I guess? And the boss like, no, you got shit to do. I mean, yeah. you want to take it? You want to take a sick day? Then take a, use up your PTO now. Or do you want to save it till after baby gets here? And like, well, I guess. Yeah. So catching dads on the front side is almost impossible. Me yeah. included, for the record. Oh, sure. For sure. Now, my husband, um, it was about two years from the moment we decided to start trying to have children to we lost mm -hmm. our first one. We got pregnant with our second and uh, whom we have now. Healthy boy. He's good. By the time he was born, it was about two years right from us deciding mm -hmm. to him being born. And it's like my husband was shocked. He was like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I oh, him so I'm a dad now. It's like, a, like somebody made a wave to magic wand, you know? <laughs> I told him so many times, I was like, you had two years to prepare for this. And now you are acting like it just came out of nowhere and caught you off guard. Right. Right. Now say, I, so at the end of each chapter of my book, I have it broken down to first trimester, second trimester, third trimester labor and delivery, which is his own big chapter, and then the fourth trimester. But at the end of each chapter, I have a summary for dads, but then I have a summary for moms. I'm like, hey, guys, have your partner read this book. So A, she doesn't think I'm over here telling you a bunch of nonsense. But B, in, in the summary, I'm like, look, he just doesn't get it. Just, just understand, he doesn't get it. So for the fourth trimester, I'm like, guess what? Your partner is probably surprised he's a dad, even though we've all known for all this time coming. Um, so I speak directly to moms, to these things. I, I'm always like, if you if you want to do something, be specific, because otherwise don't make him guess because he's going to guess wrong. And then you're both pissed off. So honey, can you please go do this one thing exactly this way? And he'll be like, yeah, sure. But don't just be like, mm, why doesn't he recognize that I'm hungry over here? Like be specific. And yes, he's going to be surprised at every step of the way. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, he was totally surprised. Uh, the biggest thing that I focused on with dads as a as a doula was trying to get them. I gave them the role of the protector. OK, mm -hmm. uh, his job was protection, especially because uh, the system is the system. And you really have to have somebody who, you know, the mom, when she's going through labor and delivery, isn't in her right mind, really. Like, right, exactly. Uh, she's she's totally blitzed out with the pain and the mechanisms and this thing that is happening to her. She can't make decisions, okay? It's up to the partner. Somebody else in the room needs to know um, needs to be educated on what she wants, uh, what is normal, what is not normal, what is, um, you know, some of the tactics that the system may use on her. Um, you know, there's, we can get into the cascade of interventions, you know, you, you go in and you get induced 
for no other reason than we're tired of being pregnant, um, which is everybody's choice. You know, I am pro choice to the extent like whatever birth you want. Our goal is to get you through it untraumatized. That is the only right, goal. Right. It uh, empowered to make those choices. Absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm also, I want, I want all my clients to make the choices that work best for them, but yeah. I also want them to be informed about what the options are, pros and cons, percentage, exactly. like, you know, be, make, make your choice, but don't do it uninformed. Cause then that, right. then you're, you're, you're just taking a shortcut there, you know, but go ahead. Sorry. No, you're exactly right. That's what it is. It's understanding that if you want to go in and get induced for no medical reason, other than you're tired of being pregnant, that it is your right to do so. And I support your right to do that. Uh, do know that it may cause contractions to be worse, it, which may make you more prone to getting an epidural. And if you don't want an epidural, then maybe that's not the best route that you go you should you know follow um right. epidurals oftentimes they they stop the pain which sounds great on the surface but the pain is what releases the chemicals that uh push labor forward so if you stop the contraction you stop the pain a lot of times labor stalls out and then mm -hmm. they give you pitocin to kick start labor more right to push those contractions further um Oftentimes that may be problematic and cause the baby to go into distress. Baby goes in distress. They're not coping well. Oh gosh, now it's a life and death situation. We're rushing you off to an emergency C-section. Um, right. So uh, partner dad's role when I was coaching people through birth stuff was you're the protector. It's your job to be educated in not only the mechanisms and how everything works, but what she wants specifically so that when nurses and doctors come in here and they start, because they're good at it. They're good at like convincing you to make decisions that you knew you spent nine months going through this and knowing the pros and cons and you made a decision early on based on the evidence that you did not want your water broken. Right. And then they come in there and they can, they're real good at convincing you that you need your water broken. And that's just an example. You know, I'm not saying that you shouldn't get your water broken. It's totally relative. It depends on the situation, but dad's job is to protect her and the baby based on what you know beforehand. That's how I always did it. So this is, this is a good, um, a good place to pause here for a second, Savannah, because this is one of the places where that's what I was told. And I embrace that. I mean, I'm a pretty smart guy. I took some, I took a bunch of biology in, in, in college and as a former business owner, I'm used to having to sort of like stand up for what I think is right in the face of opposition. So I felt fairly comfortable kind of owning that role, but going through my work and working with all these different dads I'm talking to, I realized that that was a very common assignment to the guys but ultimately i found it to be very unfair like you like if i'm not going to go into the mechanics i i don't know shit about fixing cars so if my mechanics like you need all this stuff i'm like well i mean maybe but like i have no leg to stand on why how can i argue with my mechanic when they have all the training or how can I argue with my dentist when I'm laying there in the chair with my mouth open? He's like, oh, you got a cavity, David. We're going to have to drill it and fill it, you know? Um, so what I instead started doing was saying, guys, this is why you need to be very committed to working with your partner, to creating a birth team that you feel like you, we talked about in the beginning here, like you didn't have this experience with your OB, but like finding a birth team that's on your that's going to work with you and wants to help you have the experience you want to have. So that if they say, look, you know, we're, this is what we're recommending. You already have a sense of trust and not only their ability, but their, their point of view and their preferences. Like they're not just pushing this on because they want to go eat lunch in two hours. Mm -hmm. they, they, they generally think this is in my, in my best interest. This is why I'm all about dude, hire a doula. We yeah. all know, you know, doulas are not medical experts are there for the, psychological, emotional, moral, spiritual, emotional support, yet they've probably seen a lot of births mm -hmm. and it's okay to ask your doula, like, uh, does this sound okay to you? And then they say, this is outside of my scope of practice, but I might consider recommending you get a second opinion 
or they may be like, I don't know, David, can let's see if we can ask for more time and see if, you know, she can progress a little more. But like I tell the guys your mantra for labor and delivery. And I say, it's a mantra is be calm, be, atten be attentive, be calm, and then be competent. Number one, be attentive to your partner, a hundred percent. Number two, be calm so that you can be competent because us guys like to do stuff. We're like, Oh, I got to hold a leg. Like if there's nothing happening, we're like you said, we're twiddling our thumbs. Like, can I check my email real quick on my phone? Yeah. No. Okay. I'll right here, baby. You're doing great. You know? Um, but I don't like putting guys in a position of like, if the doc, if the, if the OB with eight years of experience and who's delivered a thousand babies says they need to do something, you need to be the one who you're a plumber in your real life, but now you're going to stand up and go against the entire medical establishment. I think that's really unfair burden to put on guys. So I definitely go with the protect vibe, like the entire fourth trimester chapter of my book is called protect and serve. Mm -hmm. But in that labor and delivery, I really want them to be focused on attending to mama and being 100% connected to her and have doing that work on the front side to build that birth team. And I, I generally, if people are like, what about midwifery? I'm like, yes, do that. Yes. Uh, that's my that's my direction there because it's much more a a full compass care perspective rather than go to the local hospital. Whoever's on staff that day is your OB, and I'm sure they're well trained and competent, and whatever. But there's a lot of other incentives in place at a corporate hospital than a than a you know a family run midwifery. So you know, do your homework on the front side, guys. As hard as it may be to be thinking about, you know three months in the future. Like I joke in my book, like it's July, it's June now. You know what I'm not thinking about? Snowblowers. You know why? Because it's fucking June. Yeah. So it's hard for me to get excited about doing root research on snowblowers in June. So for a lot of guys, they're like three, four months in the pregnancy and they're like, why, why are we talking about this? Like, I, I can't, I literally cannot get my head into the space of why we need to figure this out right now. But I tell the guys like, look, A, I understand that, but B, do it anyway. Cause you'd want to make sure this isn't a snowblower we're talking about. This is your baby. This is your family. This is the beginning of your life as a parent and as a partner and as a father. Yes, now is the time to be thinking about snowblowers and babies, even if it's three, six months ahead of time. But that's my that's my spin on this. So I just wanted to speak to that now because I think a lot of guys hear that it's on you to be the protector. They're like, shit, I don't know anything about this. I'm a plumber. I'm an architect. I, I'm a professor. I am not a baby person. Like, why would I possibly argue with an OB? I, I, that would be me putting my family at risk, arguing against a medical professional. No way. So even if they nod, when the time comes, that that's not a fair place to put them would be my take on it. Oh, no, you're absolutely right. And thank you for thank you for bringing it back around to that, for sure. Again, definitely a symbol of birth team. That is 100 percent a goal that most people should start thinking about in the early months, for sure. Find a doctor that you like, know and trust to feels mm -hmm. your values on things and find a doula if you can uh medicaid uh, insurances are starting to pay for them and that is yeah thankfully oh god thankfully yes midwives absolutely wonderful holistic type of care um and i mean holistic not like uh herbs but more like you know they care about the mental right. stuff. they have more time because they have right. patience to care for um, well, you're also seeing the same person prenatal labor and delivery and postnatal. So they're, when you're seeing your midwife a week after you had your baby, they were there for your birth story. It's not just some random person. And you're like, Oh, how was your birth? And you're like, I fucking don't know. I'm still in it. Like <laughs> they know about your birth story. And so any of the stuff that has come up, they're a part of it. So you already walk in there, not having to share and relive and go through or even process it if you still haven't processed it all. So for all the reasons that you spoke to and and beyond, I think that it, the, this model is a superior model, in my opinion. I agree completely. Um, the problems that I ran into in my location with my clients <laughs> is that we're very uh, rural. So we had one hospital, hospital and two mm -hmm. doctors. And those two oh, doctors. That makes it so much harder. Yeah. Midwifery was illegal in Alabama until two years ago, three years ago. Oh my God. Yeah. So we would have yeah, to. Yeah. Home births were illegal in Nebraska where we had our babies. Home birth, I think it might still be illegal, like technically. Mm -hmm. Like you cannot do, you cannot be a home birth midwife. 
yeah. legally in the state. You have to have either be affiliated with the, a birth center or a hospital or whatever. So yeah, we're still fighting a lot of these laws that, you know, um, there may have been some good reasons to put them in place at some point, but a lot of times they're just, they're continued to sort of like protect the cartel <laughs> of a big, a big healthcare, you know? That's it, isn't it? Yeah. Um, home births are not technically illegal here, but it is illegal to assist anyone in a home birth. And if you mm. go to the hospital afterwards, just to kind of get checked out, make sure everything's cool, which is more or less what you kind of should do in most situations. Right. Right. Um, and they find out that you intentionally had a home birth. You will have child services called on you. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's the way like everybody was born in a home a hundred years ago. It's like, what, why, why are we making our entire evolutionary history illegal? <laughs> it's like, what's going on here? Yeah. Cause you know, uh, it's, it's fear mostly, I believe, um, birth is scary and birth can mm -hmm. be dangerous. It can have some bad outcomes, but the vast majority of us do okay with it. And that's what we have to remember is that the problems aren't the default. They're the exception. And if you're, mm -hmm. if you're healthy and you know, you have all your ducks in a row and you've done your research and you've prepared, then more than likely you're okay. Right. Right. And, and to, to your point, you know, infant, infant maternal mortality used to be terrible when babies were just randomly born in barns and homes and, and un, unattended, un, unsupervised by trained professionals. So all of the, you know, there's people out there who are like, what are you crazy people talking about? Like we look at where we are now compared to where a hundred years ago with these, with these rates of infant mortality, maternal mortality, this used to be like the number one killers of babies and moms was birth. And now it's not so that it, there has been a ton of progress, but this is where a lot of times, you know, people are like, well, David, you you seem confusing. Are you a conservative? Are you There's a lot of wisdom? We want to conserve from the past and traditions, culture. This is, there's a lot of good stuff here. Like there's a lot of hard fought victories we want to keep. And every one of those came about through change and focusing on, we've learned a lot of shit. We can probably still do some stuff better. So I think this is where modern midwifery is a great example of this, where we're bringing a lot of trained medical attention and skill into birth, but in an environment where moms are like, oh, I'm in my bedroom, where I feel safe, where I feel comfortable, where I feel grounded, where I feel connected, which is automatically going to lead to better birth outcomes if the mom is relaxed, calm, feels cared for, feels safe, et cetera. And you have trained medical professionals there to assist and guide. And if things get scary, call 911. Like we need to get to the hospital. This has gone from a birth into an emergency. We need to get the hospital right away. And the midwifery model is, is has great outcome percentages. I don't, I can't cite them right here, but, but this is the best of both worlds, in my opinion. Um, again, and I'm just a dad. I'm not a medical professional. I'm not a lawyer. I'm just a dad in the birth space trying to help people have an easier time. So don't, you know, please go consult your medical professional and your lawyer rather than just mm -hmm. lend to some guy off the internet. Uh, but that, that's my, that's my understanding of things. So that's where I feel we have an ability to conserve the best of our past and our, and our, and our tradition and our culture and our history and make progress and bring some of the, the newest, most helpful uh, teachings and technologies in together to really help us move forward in a way that it's is balanced, you know? I agree completely. And midwifery is really um, closing the gaps that are there in between um, the tragic past and the also can still be tragic present because, you know. Uh, right, right. The Western world has one of the highest uh, maternal mortality rates in the developed world, which is... Mm -hmm you know, makes you really question uh, what we're doing. And that's a, that's a big thing that got me into doula work is that we had these practices that were set in place in the fifties based on the research that we had available in the fifties that we have right. since disproved or, you know, found other um, research that has shown that, that maybe those are not at all the best practices, but right. <laughs> as it turns still, out, <laughs> <laughs> 
but we're still doing them, which can be right. Problem. Right. So I know we're we're coming towards the end of our time here. I'd love to talk a little bit about new parenthood and like new baby space. Um, because I think that's where most of my dad clients are really coming from as they're showing up and be like, hey, David, like baby's home, you know, I'm struggling now and my partner's struggling and like, you know, that sort of blissful ignorance of being a dad to be the expectant dad is suddenly crashed yeah. by baby's arrival. So um, what what kind of topics or questions or things are most you know relevant for you and your audience when it comes to new baby space and how can I maybe add some color commentary into that from my from my dad perspective? Well, my audience and what we do mostly is we heal ourselves to heal the world. So whatever you want to run with that. And most of most okay, of the great. Is that <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, don't we all these days like yes. right where, where I live now in Fairfax, Virginia, there's some smoke for some Canadian wildfires. And yeah, you can smell the smoke in the air and it's hazy, but like everybody's running around like, oh no, we're all going to die. I'm like, come on guys. Like it's, it's, this is like having s'mores. Like we're not going to die from sniffing some smoke from a wildfire 500 miles away. Come on. Like, like, let's just bring this down. Cause the, my point is that anxiety is a pusher. That's big idea. Number five in my book, by the way, is for the guys, like your partner is a mom today and she's gonna be feeling a lot of anxiety this is the biggest deal ever this is bigger than marriage graduation promotion riding a bike all that shit combined going to be a mom biggest deal ever and we live in a world that's full of like shit like mm -hmm. what, what's in my cleaning product what's in my food can i eat this sushi or this cheese like everything's dangerous and so yeah. that heightened anxiety is turned up to 11 with that positive pregnancy test and for a lot of guys they're like cool gonna be a dad later I want to crack a beer. Yay me. I got strong sperm, you know? So we have a very different relationship to that. Um, but new parenthood is when all that hits God, dads. Cause like, shit, I got a baby now. And like, what's going on? It's like, we've been trying to tell you, dude, you're going to be a dad. This is what this looks like. So healing ourselves. I think this idea of the masculine that we touched upon a little bit earlier, this is something I really try to focus on a lot with my new dads. Cause I, I see them in like, number one, am I, I have, I have a free monthly zoom group. I'll, we'll put in your show notes. Yeah. Any new dad or expectant dad can come join our group. It's once a month. It's the third Thursday of the month going forward. It's going to be, um, it's about an hour, hour and a half. Usually it's just a place to come in and not have anybody tell you you're doing it wrong. So the number one thing I say is like, look, guys are people too. We have our emotions. We have our feelings. We have our frustrations. We have our anxiety. We have our depression. We have our like being overwhelmed and new parenthood for a lot of the guys I see is completely overwhelming. Mm -hmm. They've lost their partner. They're like, Hey, what happened? Like what happened to us? Cause like, I'm a third wheel over here. And you're like, I don't recognize you. You're mad at me. I just walked in and I'm, I'm, I'm just walking and I've done something wrong or like, I didn't do it right. Or I didn't do it well enough. And this is a really tough space for new parents to be in. Yeah. And I tell the guys, I, I give them all the room in the world to like really just lay out what's going on. And 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 I never say, well, she had the baby because that's what they hear all the time. Oh, you know, you're upset. She had a baby. Trump card. She wins. You're, you don't count. You're gaslit. Your experience doesn't matter. So we want to make a time for that. And we want them to understand, appreciate that there's not a magic mom book that all the new moms are reading about how to do it right. Like new moms are struggling. Mm -hmm. All new parents are struggling. We don't have the village that we used to sort of be yeah. born in, grow up in, see, be surrounded by babies and birth. Like you mentioned earlier, 15 kids, like most people in prehistory, anywhere, like, you know, a couple hundred years ago and beyond anywhere on the planet were surrounded by babies yeah. all the time. They saw babies. They saw babies being born, babies dying, nursing. They, they never had any questions about what is, what do we do? Cause they, they lived it. There was never like, how do we, what are you doing? You're pregnant. Well, they just do all the things that they've been seeing for years, you know? Mm -hmm. So right now we're in this great unraveling mm -hmm. where everything's up in the air and guys are like, oh, what am I supposed to do? And like, whatever you want, be helpful and supportive. And they're like, that's not helpful. And new mom's mm -hmm. like, ah, where's my village? And like, you're it and go get a job and be a, be superwoman. They're like, that fucking sucks. Like what's going on here? Mm -hmm. People move away from their families you know, there's a lot of things and I'm not shitting on any one of these individually. I'm just saying we need to appreciate how hard it is for new parents in this nuclear family of trying to figure out what does it mean to be going from maidenhood to motherhood? 
What does it mean going from the dude zone to the dad zone? What does success look like here? Where's my help? How am I supposed to do this? If I'm frustrated, underfed, underslept, under, under some sleep deprived, and my partner is, and now we're arguing, we're in a heated fight about which way the forks are supposed to be in the drying rack. Like, what the fuck? Yeah. Like, we're all stressed out and we're not really being given a place to really be seen, allowed to be messy, allowed to kind of fall apart for a little bit and just kind of cry for a bit and then be like, yeah, it's hard. And then not immediately be deluged with a bunch of, well, do all these things different. It'll be better. It's like, no, just, just, it's just hard. Let's just create space for that. So for the healing side of things, I think the first step from my point of view is to recognize that this shit is hard and there's not, there's not a guidebook. It's not your fault that you're struggling mom, new moms, new dads. We're in, we're lost. Our culture is disconnected from the past and it hasn't landed in the future yet. So we're in this sort of nebulous space where every, there's no up, there's no down, left is right. All kinds of crazy shit's going on. Everything that seemed to be pretty sure up until even five years ago, like, well, I guess that's not sure anymore either. I guess everything's up for debate. Everybody's up for an argument. What's going on? And no wonder we're all having a hard time. So I think just creating space for each person to be allowed to have their own experience and not be corrected, helped, supported, argued against, and just that space to kind of fall apart and be a little bit messy and just get that love and support and acknowledgement that it's a hard journey. It's a hard struggle, I think is something we can all do better. So that would be my my initial rant on the healing side of, of what new parents mm -hmm. that I see are needing and what they're benefiting from. I think that's beautiful. That's awesome. I love what you're doing here. I love this conversation. Thank you so much for coming out with us today and having a talk about it. Give you a virtual hug. It was awesome. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Savannah. Thanks for, uh, you know, providing the forum for us to have this conversation and for sharing some of your experiences and what brought you into the birth work and, and how you um, are showing up to continue to kind of try to push the ball forward and help all of us land in a little better place than where you and I had to kind of walk through in our early steps here. So much appreciation to you and your work as well. Well, thank you. You want to tell people where you can, where you're most active, where they can find you. And then of course, sure, the best place, I'm sorry. Yeah. The best place to be welcome to fatherhood.com, www.welcome to fatherhood.com. Everything I do is on there. I have the podcast that you mentioned earlier. That's called baby talk with Katie and David. Uh, me and my co-host, Katie Demota, she's a lactation consultant. We talk about all things babies, postpartum, new parenthood. Um, we're in our third season now. So that's baby talk uh, with Katie and David. And then my book's on Amazon. Links will be there. I do my workshops. Uh, the Dad's Own Thriving Workshop is actually tonight. So nobody in your audience is going to be able to catch that because it'll be probably go out later. But that's once a month. There's a different episode. I do a three episode, a three workshop series. Um, and then, uh, I have my monthly support group that's free for anybody. And I also do a lot of dad coaching one-on-one. -on -one. So all that can be found on the umbrella of www.welcometofatherhood.com. Awesome. And you are a great resource that I will be for sure sending everybody. Thanks, Savannah. Thank you so much. You have a great day. That was awesome. Definitely go check David Arell out. Buy his book, give it all of the recommendations, give it to all of your friends who are expecting and, you know, help all the dads out in your life. Y'all have a great day and namaste.